There is a lot to talk about when it comes to this week's episode of Kimetsu no Yaiba. But if there is one scene that really just hit me right in the heart, it was the scene when Tanjiro finally came back from the selection and he sees his sensei. And his sensei, when he lays eyes upon Tanjiro for the first time in a while, you see him look at him, no words being said, he drops what was in his hand, the wood he was carrying, and then quickly rushes over to Tanjiro. It's a very powerful scene, because, like I said in my last week's episode review of Kimetsu no Yaiba, the man doesn't say a whole lot. He, he's a man of very few words, but when he does talk, usually it matters. And you can see from just his character interactions alone from last week's episode, he deeply cares about his students. Not just Tanjiro, but his students. He really does care for them and watches over them. And because of all the recent events that's happened in his life, where everyone he trains ends up dying to this morphed demon, he just stopped really wanting to take in students, or he didn't really want Tanjiro to face that demon, and he didn't really want to go, you know, grow close to the man. But obviously things happened, and Tanjiro walked into the frying pan. And... At the beginning of last week's episode, it was very obvious that the sensei, he felt like there was a chance, but at the same time, this could be the last time he sees Tanjiro. He might be expecting Tanjiro just to be walking towards his death and never to come back. And so, he was pretty much under the impression that he just sent his student off to die. And you gotta imagine the emotional weight he carries with that, because we get to see a brief backstory at the beginning of this episode of the sensei capturing the very demon that has killed all of his students. And you gotta imagine, someone that is the sensei failing to protect so many students probably weighs heavily on your soul. Like, it's not his fault necessarily, but at the same time, him not finishing that demon off and technically being the one to capture it is technically the cause of why all the children have died. And so he obviously blames himself, he carries that burden, and he was ready to carry another burden, the death of Tanjiro, but obviously that did not happen, and when Tanjiro walks up to him and he basically explains his story that the demon is long gone, you can just see from the brief little exchange that he has a sign of relief. He, he's just relieved that the misery is over, that he can finally say that his, you know, students can rest in peace. They are no longer going to plague his mind to where, like, he sent them off to die and that monster's still around thanks to him. This will allow the sensei to gain more students and raise them and teach them without the possible worry of that demon personally going out of his way and hunting down the students. So, it's great. It, it's just a really good scene, and I think just the subtle way of telling this character's story without, you know, words alone is beautiful. And honestly, it's made me fall in love with Kimetsu no Yaiba. I already like this story, I like the themes of it, I like the characters, but just the sensei alone and just the amount of detail put into him is amazing. I really am just satisfied with this first arc of Demon Slayer. So let's get into something I noticed, okay? Now, I've already mentioned this on Twitter at the time of me currently talking about this, but at the same time, not everybody checks my Twitter, so I want to say what I said on Twitter. Basically, if you watched my last week's video, I talked about how these swords, the steel that make these Demon Slayer swords, obviously there's something very special about them. Yes, there is a special steel, but it's never clarified exactly what it was. Now, we do get some clarification in this episode, that apparently on the top of the highest mountain that's closest to the sun, there is ore that is mined that could be used for a blade, which is what is used in Tanjiro's blade, and that is what he forges his sword from. But once again, it's still not really clarified exactly all about this ore, like the nitty gritty details of it, and so I'm just like there's still so much blank, like black marks throughout the history of how these swords are created to what this ore really is made from. So there's still just as many questions as I had last week when it came to the sword. However, there was a few things that made me go, huh? Number one, Tondro, after he passes the selection and he leaves, he walks out and all that to basically say he's a victor, 
he states like there was 20 of us, but there's only four left. And so he's like, wow, so many people died. 16 people died. And then while this scene is going on, eventually we get like a, another scene happen at the same time to where you see this dude, a man behind the scenes, I'm assuming is the one that leads to Demon Slayer Core. He is the person that states that five survived, even though Tanjiro himself stated only four were currently present. So this is one of two things. Either A, someone already passed the selection and already up and left, or they were still in there in the woods and have yet to really arrive. Whatever the case may be, he did say five survived, even though Tanjiro said four. So unless there's a translation error, then that would mean that that means five out of the 20 survived. Now, to continue on, what I'm trying to say is that when they have to select their ore, like for instance, Tanjiro has to select the ore to be able to make his sword, if you look at the number of ore on the table, there's 15. Now, to kind of explain here, there's a lot of numbers, is that there was apparently 20 children, 5 survived, that means that only 15 died out of the 20, and there's 15 ore on the table. To kind of put A and B together, basically what I'm trying to say is, is that, hypothetically, I'm not saying this is what's going on, but it's possible that the deceased children, the contestants, were, in fact, the ore presented on the table. Now, once again, I do know that it was stated in this, you know, episode that the, some of the ore was used from the highest point of a mountain close to the sun. But once again, we still don't know really the main essence of what this ore really is and how this world works. So it still could be souls pressed into it for all we know or demons, whatever. And so thinking about it, I'm like 15 ore on that table, 15 apparently died and there's five left. I'm like, Something's adding up right there. Like, things are adding up, like, way too well with the potential theory that the deceased are turned into that. Now, I, like I said, I could be wrong, but I just wanted to point that out because it was very apparent after, you know, looking at this episode and re-watching that scene multiple times. So, anyways, let's, um, let's talk about the blade that Tondro now possesses. So, the blade he has, apparently... It's a special blade, obviously. He's the MC, so he needs to have something special. He has this blade that could turn solid black. Now, basically, it's a very rare color. That's what was stated. It's very rare. It's not something you normally see. Now, I don't know necessarily if that's a good or a bad thing, but most likely it's a good thing because usually in a Shonen series, if the MC usually gets something that you rarely see, then most likely it's something incredibly powerful or something that not many really know much about, and I feel like that's kind of the main purpose here. However, there is a little bit of backstory stated to Tadro's origin, his blood in general. Apparently to his eye color, to the tint of his hair with the reddish color, he has a very special birth. He's like the, uh, like a sun child, basically. And this is very peculiar. For that being stated like that, this means that it is common knowledge, because it was apparent from the sensei that he was aware of it when they were talking about the swords. So, for this never to be mentioned, there's probably a couple of reasons for this. A, most likely, the people that are born like this are extremely special and gifted, which means that they're a very major threat to demons itself, or there's something else, maybe darker in origin. Whatever the case may be, though, this might be the reason why Tondro's family was hunted. Because, think about it, if these, you know, son children or whatever are special, and they can have these special blades that can turn red or whatever, then that would necessarily mean that Tondro's entire family technically was a threat. There's a possibility that that is the reason why they were attacked to begin with, because the family was very special, and the bloodline needed to be completely destroyed and eradicated. That's probably why they were attacked. That's my personal two cents on that. But okay, uh, what else is really left to talk about? So, um... Let's talk about the characters that survived the selection. So, we have a dude that is very hot-headed with Bakugo's voice actor. Very fitting, because I couldn't think of a better voice actor for any character that's hot-headed. And this dude right here, I'm just gonna be honest, I don't really know how to peg him right now. I, I think he's probably deep down a good guy. But there's obviously a major motive here. For him to constantly say he wants a sword right then and now, that basically means that something's happened where he really does need that blade snappy. So, what I'm assuming is, is either A, he is someone that has had his entire family eradicated by demons, he wants to get vengeance. That's a possibility. It's a very standard shonen thing to see for a character. Or B, 
his, you know, I guess entire village is in danger, and so he wants to be able to protect them because there's a lot of demon attacks, and so he's going out of his way to get the sword as quickly as possible for he can protect them. Or another example is, it's one of his family members were turned into a demon, and he wants to personally put them down. That's the only thing I could assume why the character would want a sword that badly, unless he has evil intentions and he's not necessarily a good dude. I do have a quick question about that, because that's not really clarified at all, but I wonder what would happen if a demon slayer was to become a demon. That That's never clarified. I don't think that has been clarified. What would happen? Like, hypothetically, if Tondro was to turn into a demon, what would happen? Like, would he still work for the demon slayers if he doesn't, you know devour any human or they completely try to kill him instantly there's so many questions i have about that because that's not clarified either so what would happen to a demon slayer if they were turned into a demon and what if that character might have something like that happen i don't know it could be setting up for something like that regard because of whole vengeance or something maybe behind the scenes but yeah Overall, it's a good episode of Kimetsu no Yaiba. I liked it from start to finish. I think many can agree with me. And there is a lot of setup for events to come. I do like how uh, Tanjiro has his first assignment, his objective, to go to this village in the northwest that is apparently having problems to where women are just disappearing and being devoured by demons. So, I'm looking forward to how Tanjiro handles his assignments, and I'm looking forward to seeing how he can handle things on his own without the help of others. I mean, he didn't really get much help either when I think about it. About it but I just I would like to see how he handles it because now things are going to get a lot more interesting he's no longer playing in an area or fighting in an area that's self-contained like he has to actually fight demons that are very strong incredibly OP have their own abilities that can really just end someone instantly oh yes and uh, one last thing I do want to talk about is the fact that we get a reminder that most of these demons in the story the reason why they're in the position of probably being devourers of humanity is probably because it was against their will. Not everybody is Nezuko to where they could fight back against their instincts. See, the hunger that you feel as soon as they are born as demons. And so seeing that brief little scene where the demon that Tondro slayed was sinking back to how he forgot about his brother and the reason, or the first person he ever ate was his brother, it's pretty freaking sad. And I feel like this is a major message here that there's going to be more to the story than Tondro just wanting to save his sister. He might try in some cases to save all of demons because not every demon is probably willingly wanting to be one, but they're just forced to be like that. But I think I want to leave it at that. So with that, I think I want to wrap up this video here. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy my content, you know, please subscribe. If you like this video, please leave a like. And if you want to get notified for whenever I upload a video, please click the bell icon down below. And with that, Chibi out.